Welcome to this worship on this 12th, 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, take a look at the announcements. There's not much for this week. Um, Bible study will resume a week from Wednesday on the 21st. Um, of course, we've got the uh, music on the lawn coming up in the Sundays of September after Labor Day weekend. Are there any other announcements in the life of the church? I understand that the, the golf outing went well, and uh, some won and some lost, but, <laughs> but nobody was counting. If there are no other announcements, then we'll go begin with our prayer preparation. Please join with me in it. God in heaven, whose goodness we have tasted and seen, let us praise you in all things and in all ways. Most of all, Help us to trust you in all things and all ways, so that when we feel the most alone, we will know that we are never alone. And in that, as in all things, we give you glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. And please stand with me and join in the call to worship adapted from Psalm 34. We will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise always in our mouths. Our souls boast only in the Lord, who is all our confidence, the joy and refuge of the humble. We will magnify God's name. We will exalt his name together. For God will deliver us from all our fears. Look to God and be radiant. Cry out to God and be saved. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find their refuge in him. And we'll sing the first three verses of the song on the insert, Lord, I bring my songs to you. As we go to the prayer of confession, please join with me in it. Lord, it's too easy to give up. It's too easy to say, I'm the only one left. No one else cares. It's too easy even to begin thinking that you have forgotten, that you have fallen asleep, that even you don't care. Lord, if we give in to this too easy temptation, save us from it. Awaken our hearts, alert our minds and spirits, change our mistaken way of thinking, and forgive us for trusting too little in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take a moment of confession in our own hearts.
Everything about God is trustworthy, especially his promise to forgive us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, our hearts are washed, our spirits renewed. Praise be to God. can now join with the dog across the street in wishing one another <laughs> the peace of Christ. His compression was not so high. Let's say. Please bow with me for the prayer of illumination. Lord, teach us today, enliven us today. By your Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we pray, enter us today. Amen. This uh, radical crowd here. I tell you, it's, li it's like when I used to be in the, the bar bands and I had to play for rowdy groups. I don't know. It was terrible. Our first reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, 25 through 5 2. Here Paul writes So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And then we'll turn to the Old Testament. We're going to be reading this in two parts. This is a story of the prophet Elijah. You've heard this story before many times. Elijah has just come off a, a pretty good day. He has just uh, had a battle with the prophets of Baal up in the northern kingdom of Israel. Unfortunately, he is, and, and 
and God has given them a great victory over those prophets, but unfortunately it has stirred up the anger of Queen Jezebel. And that's why we pick up the story this morning. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and he came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Are there young disciples who would like to come forward before Sunday school? (laughs) I think, they're, um, I think you're blackmailing them with Sunday school. <laughs> All right. I'll try not to make this too painful for you. We just heard uh, the story, the beginning, just the beginning of the story of the prophet Elijah. And where we left him, he was sitting under a, a broom tree. And a broom tree... Um, Imagine a tree that looked like a broom, just all kind of spiny and stuck out in all directions. It's a shrub tree, if any of you have ever seen a shrub tree. It's just a really, it's a desert tree too, so it's not lush. It's just kind of stickly, sticky looking. So he was sat down under this broom tree and he fell asleep because he was so worn out. Jezebel the queen was out to get him, and he felt like he was out of luck. And in fact, he felt he was so out of luck. Did you notice what he he asked God? Did you happen to notice what? He said, just let me die. I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this. I can't do anything more. Just let me die. And he lay down and fell asleep. And that's where we left him. That was the last verse we read. So what do you think? Is God just going to let him lay down and die? You don't think so? You want to make any bets on it? (laughs) (laughs) They're not taking it. Anybody else want to make a bet on it? No, you're right. You're right. God's not going to let him go. He's going to, first of all, give him some food to get him back on his feet. And then he's going to take him to a mountain. And there, Elijah is going to learn how to get strengthened again by God. And this this story tells us something very important that I suspect all of us at some point or another get really down, really like we don't feel like doing anything, we don't feel like getting anywhere, we don't feel like anything. Maybe we don't say, I just want to die, but maybe we feel that way sometimes. And God doesn't leave us there. God didn't leave Elijah there, as you will maybe hear later, and God won't leave us there either. So let's pray before you go back to Sunday school and give thanks. Lord, we thank you that no matter how down we get, you don't leave us alone, but you send us what we need. You send us the people we need. You send us the love we need, and you strengthen us. And we thank you especially that you sent us Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you uh, hang ahead on to Sunday school. So we'll pick up the story now at 5b. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb the mountain of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, 
I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. But God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And there a voice came to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and, your, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, Eli Elisha, son of Saphat, of Abel Mehalah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. Whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of our mouth and meditations of our heart be acceptable in the sight of God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If any of you, like me, uh, suffer from bouts of depression, then you will know that these times of melancholy and despair are not reasonable. They're not necessarily rational. They don't necessarily coincide with any specific events that occur during our lives. Depression sets in wherever it wants to, even if there's no easily determined reason for it. It's not normal sadness. Sadness has a reason, something bad or at least troubling, something you can't identify has happened to you or to someone you care about. The result is sadness. Depression is also not normal pain or misery. Pain and misery come as a result of physical or, or emotional stresses or injury. They are concrete consequences of stimuli that we can name, we can see. But although depression may be miserable and painful and cause sadness, it's not exactly any of these. Because depression often lifts its ugly head at times where there is, at least on the surface of the things, nothing wrong at all. When there is no obvious or logical event or stimulus to make you feel pain or sadness or despairing misery, depression can come about even when it appears that everything is just fine. Spiritual depression, a crisis or distress of the heart and soul, shares this trait, and it seems to be what's afflicting the prophet Elijah as we read about him in 1 Kings 19. Now, to all intents and purposes, Elijah should be riding high as we open this story. He's just come out of a major confrontation with the pagan priests of Baal, the god of the Canaanites, and too often of the Israelites up on Mount Carmel. God has waged spiritual war against the priests of Baal there and won out soundly, and the people of Israel, previously unsure about to whom they will be faithful, have come back to God and to God's prophet Elijah. However, as 19 opens, we discover there's at least one person who's very put off by this battle of gods and its outcome, for the prophets of Baal, uh, for the prophets of Baal who have been put to sword by angry Israelites have distressed her. This person is, of course, Queen Jezebel, the wife of Israel's King Ahab, who is herself a strong devotee of Baal and Baal's retinue. So distressed is Jezebel by the turn of events transpiring at the mountain that she sends a message to Elijah. 
So may the gods do to me and more if I don't make you like one of Baal's prophets tomorrow. That is dead. Now again, one might think that just having come out of a situation in which God acted mightily for Elijah, the prophet would have had the spiritual stamina to stand up against this threat. God had been with him in Carmel. Certainly God would continue to be with him if Jezebel came seeking vengeance. But spiritual depression is not reasonable. It arrives when we don't expect it. And it can arrive with notable effect. It certainly does for Elijah, who, hearing Jezebel's words against him, immediately flees the northern kingdom of Israel for the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, if all of this, if, if this was all that he had done, we might say, well, he was just being cautious. He was kind of wise there. Israel was, after all, the place where Jezebel and her husband Ahab had all the power. They were in charge like people who make a temporary evacuation of their homes ahead of a storm or a fire, it would make absolute sense for Elijah to leave Israel and go to Judah for a while where he might find protection. But Elijah goes way beyond this. Leaving his servant behind him in Beersheba of Judah, Elijah himself continues south into the desert, into the wilderness, and there, exhausted by his travel and the burden of a depressed state, sits himself down under a solitary broom tree, a desert shrub, a desolate picture if there ever is one, seeming to graphically portray Elijah's mental state. And there he calls out to God, asking that he might die. It's enough, Lord, it's too much. Take away my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. That is, again, dead and gone. And speaking truly, there seems to be very little left in the prophet, physical or spiritual. But God doesn't consent to Elijah's despairing prayer. Instead, God sends an angel to the prophet who prepares food and water for him and tells him to eat. Elijah does so a little, but then falling back into his funk, he falls asleep again. He's awakened again, though, by the angel who now insists that he eat, this time telling him, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Now, obviously, the journey so far has been way too much for him, but God's not done with this prophet. So if the angel's insistent, Elijah eats, and then, at God's insistence, begins a new journey into the desert. On the strength of the food, the text tells us, Elijah went on 40 days and 40 nights more to Horeb, the mountain of God, another name for Mount Sinai, where God had met with Moses and the Israelites on their way out of Egypt toward the Promised Land, and there given them the law, God's guidance for what would be their new lives. And as God had given this start to Israel there at Sinai, God will now give us the same kind of start to this, same, to this worn out man. So on the strength of the food God has provided, as God has provided manna to Israel for his 40 years in the wilderness, Elijah travels on to Sinai, not 40 years like Israel, but 40 days and 40 nights. Finally taking refuge there in a cave. And upon arrival at the mountain, Elijah is asked a question by God. The voice of the Lord comes to him and says, Elijah, why are you here? Now he might have responded, well, because you brought me here. But he doesn't. Instead, the prophet moans out a lament. I have been zealous for you, the Lord, the God of hosts, but the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets, and I alone am left. And they're seeking to take my life. Now, God does not give him an answer for this, but rather tells him, go out, stand out outside the cave on the mountain, as Moses has stood before the Lord on this same mountain. And there Elijah beholds three explosions of nature, First, there was a wind so strong it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks. Then there was an earthquake. Then there was a great fire, maybe a lightning storm. And one might think that God was somehow speaking to Elijah through these powerful demonstrations of nature. Certainly God in the past had appeared in smoke and wind and lightning and thunder. But the text tells us that wasn't the case today. God was in none of them. It's not even certain that God is in what happens next. An indescribable sound of silence. A sheer silence. 
that could be heard somehow and even felt. But something is happening in that silence because as Elijah, enwrapped in its stillness, his head wrapped in his mantle, perhaps to hide his eyes from the true power of God as Moses has had to do so many centuries before, as, Moses, as Elijah goes out before God, the silence is broken by the same question we've heard before. Now, I wrote in the sermon, it's written here, the, the voice came from God again, but as I read the text again, we don't know that it came from God. Maybe it was Elijah himself speaking to himself there as he stood there. Why am I here? What are you doing here? He gives the same answer, but this time it seems to have lost most of its weight and its urgency, and God doesn't even bother to acknowledge it. Instead, God tells the prophet to get back to work. Commentators have all guessed at what the wind and the earthquake and the fire and the silence all mean. But there's no definitive answer. They're, perhaps they're just a part of God's mystery. But I'll take a swing at it, of course, like every commentator before me, might as well. I rather suspect that what those violent excesses of nature which come first and of which we are specifically told that God is not in them signify all the violent and powerful upheavals of history. The great events of human striving and wars and rumors of wars, the threats of kings and queens and rulers. But although at times God might use those to his purpose, they are not primarily where God is to be found. Rather, God has to be found in a silence deep enough and quiet enough to allow us to hear God speak above all that worldly racket, to hear God call us, to hear God challenge us, and in that challenge, renew us. This appears to be what happens with Elijah. He is challenged by God to take his mantle, which represents his role as a prophet, take it off your face, put it back on your shoulders, and get back to doing what I have told you to do. Bring God's word, announce God's will, anoint new kings, and anoint a new prophet who will carry on Elijah's work after he's gone. And he told a very important fact, disputing his previous complaining. You're not alone in this. First of all, I'm God and I'm never gone, but there are also, no matter what you might think or how it might feel, 7,000 more in Israel who are still faithful, have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. Before, Elijah had gotten up from the, under the tree and traveled in the strength of the food given him by the angel. Now he gets up and goes down the mountain and travels back toward Israel. Strengthened and renewed by a stronger food, God's word and challenge and task. And the first thing he does is to find Elisha. And throwing his mantle over the young man, and lifts him to God's work. A work which will continue. Elijah's spiritual depression, thrown off like a shadow by the call of God and the promise of community with God and God's people. Now this is all very interesting. But one might justifiably wonder... If you have ever felt such, felt such a spiritual depression set into your soul, as Elijah apparently did, what in the world does this story have to do with me? I'm not a prophet. I won't likely be called to a mountain to witness outbursts of nature and a mystical silence, and I won't be, I don't think, sent out to anoint any kings. I'm just a regular old Christian who sometimes feels alone a bit down, a bit incapable, and a bit ready to give up. So what about me? But I'm not at all certain that we're any different from Elijah, nor is the way God renews Elijah very different from the way God will renew us. Neither is Paul sure about this. For in the latter part of the letter to the Ephesians, two people who like Elijah and like us might be wondering how do we keep going in a world which is so often cold and indifferent and even hostile, Paul gives them and us some instruction. First, as did God, Paul offers a challenge, given in a number of short pieces of spiritual advice. He starts off with by saying, when you're working and dealing with other people in your faith community, remember that you're all part of one holy body. Since that's the case, don't be fake or false. Speak truthfully and sincerely to one another. 
treat each other with respect that way. You may not be a prophet, but you can still speak the word of God as you understand it and do so faithfully and honestly. Now, if you get angry with one another, and you will, Paul knows, that's going to happen, just don't let it last. Deal with it. Don't let the sun go down, still chewing on it like a piece of stale gum, but work it out with, one, with the one you're divided from by anger. And most of all, don't hold it like a grudge in your heart where Satan can twist it and turn it and use it against you in the community of Christ. Now, hopefully not many of us are thieves, but the advice Paul gives them applies to us as well. Do something productive with your time. Let that be something you can share. It's like spiritual depression. It just stops whenever it feels like it. <laughs> Interestingly, Paul could have applied this maxim to the very richest members of the congregation. Don't steal from others by hoarding all you have for yourself or maybe even cheating others to benefit yourself. Do whatever you do so you can share some with the poorer brothers and sisters. Remember, they and you are in the same body. And one of the things we should be sharing always is grace of speech. An attitude of love, not bitterness or wrath or name calling and judgmentalism, all of which grieve the Holy Spirit when they rise and grow like a bruise in the body of Christ and tear it apart, Instead, make the spirit rejoice by being kind and generous and considerate and forgiving to one another. Now, all of these are challenges that every Christian shares and should desire to strive toward, not alone, but with God in Christ. And all can be summed up simply by those ending words, imitate God. Live in love as Christ did for us, giving himself up for our good, for our salvation. But we also strive toward them together with each other. Notice what all of these practices, if followed, will do. They will strengthen everyone together. They will strengthen the body, the whole church. They are intended to be ways that we live with one another and share strength with one another and find community with one another so that we come to know that we're never alone. We are never abandoned by God or the Spirit or by Jesus or by the great gift Jesus gave us of each other. The faithful, mutual life of God's children, even in the face of spiritual depression, to which there is a way out that God will provide. Now, I sincerely hope that if anyone here besides me suffers from the emotional and even physical roller coaster they call depression, and maybe you've always kept quiet about it, you don't keep quiet anymore, but seek some help. Go to a doctor, seek out some assistance. The day of depressions being something to hide is or should be long past. Don't ignore it or try to. Help is there, get it. And don't ignore spiritual depression when and if it comes. Seek your first help from the great physician and listen to him in the silence of your heart, remembering that the medicine Christ gives will sometimes take the form of a challenge, a call. But also remember that no calling and no challenge is on us alone. We share the yoke with Jesus and with each other, building one another up, bearing with one another's burdens, bringing a word of comfort and truth from the heart of God to a suffering fellow worker so that later they can bring one to you. Don't waste time worrying about the fires and earthquakes and winds of life. They'll come and they'll go and God will deal with them as he will. But listen for the stillness of God calling to you, calling for you to do something. For God will call, a call that brings life and in that call and in the church, in the life Jesus sets before us, we can find renewal, even in the desert. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll ask you to join with me now in our affirmation of faith, which has been taken from the brief statement of faith in our book of confessions. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, 
feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll stand for our hymn of response on page 639, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. You may be seated. As we go now to our time of prayer, we continue to remember Martha Bell, who is in Countryside um, out in Jackson. Uh, she rehabilitates there. Um, she's working to get back and stronger and seems to be in pretty good spirits, but it's still there. So uh, we'll continue to pray for Martha Bell. Are there others to add this morning? And please hold off and wait until you get the mic. I've been told to instruct you. We ha oh. I, I'm oh. reading. I'm going. I have my own mic. <laughs> we have a birthday coming oh. up on Saturday, Jim. Saturday, yeah. Nobody's Jim. admitting Jim to Bongar it. Jim Bongar. Yes, you. It's in the book. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then we've got one next week on Monday, so not the next week. Just Jim. Okay. We're so confused. We're having Jim's birthday song. I see. Okay. Here we go. used to sing that in old England. Happy birthday to thou. Happy birthday to thou. Happy <laughs> no, birthday to that. that would be hard. Um, are there any further prayer requests? 
Hearing none, let us go to prayer, ending with together with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, do you think, we thank you that at the times when we fall farthest away from you, we think you're never far away from us. We thank you that when we think there is no reason to keep going, that, that maybe the world would be better off without us, you have a plan. You have something for us. You have something to lift us up, and you will do it. And we thank you, Lord, that you gave Jesus, who died on the cross, without ever giving up. You gave us a model in him. But more than just a model of obedience and love in him, you gave us power in him. And you gave us an inheritance that's unfading and unperishable. And these are all things that we have from you, along with that guarantee that you're not going to leave us alone. We thank you and we give you praise. We pray that no one in a congregation would ever feel alone, that they would reach out to someone. And if they don't, Lord, we ask that you reach out and bring them to someone, that they can talk, that they can bring it together, that they can hear your word being spoken. Today, Lord, we also pray for Martha Bell. As she's in uh, rehab, we ask you to continue to be with her in that, give her strength and help her to get to the point where she can get out of there to wherever she's going to go. Uh, she's not sure, but Lord, you know the way for her, so we ask you to be with her in it. We pray, Lord, for any need that's out there that's not spoken, whether it's for ourselves or for someone else, or for the world, or for the nation, because there's needs in every place. You know them all. We ask you to be with them all, and we ask you to be with the church, that the church would be your body reaching out in your name with your love and your care. Help us to treat one another well so that the world may see your love and your life in us. We praise you, we thank you, we give you all glory. And we pray to you in Jesus' name who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'll be receiving the offering. We'll conclude with our final hymn on page 440, So Send I You by Grace Made Strong.
Jesus says, I'm sending you out into the world, but I'm not sending you alone. You will have a comforter. You will have the presence of God with you. Let us go in that presence and in that strength. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>